a rising tide lifts all ships. Like when you have quality properties, then that just increases value and increases tourism to those areas. My pleasure to welcome Patrick Spitek to the show. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Tell us about your short-term real estate business slash portfolio today. How's it look like? I currently have five properties that I own, and then I manage total 53 sign. I got a job working for a short-term rental company, eventually fell on short-term rentals. I was like, I really want to do this thing. I said, screw it. I'm just going to buy one. The hardest things to do in business is like having good, sustainable, long-term relationships. Those are the ones that like really add value to you long-term because they're like so rare, actually. Well, money is great, but more than that, just mentorship and, and growth and scale together. Welcome back to STR Like The Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. It's my pleasure to welcome Patrick Switek to the show. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. Hey, no, thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. I'm following you a while on social media. We finally met in, in Nashville, so I'm glad uh, able to. It's always crazy during conferences. You never get to talk to anyone, actually. Um, so it's I nice know. to have this opportunity to just actually get to know each other a little better and uh, introduce you to the audience. So with that being, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Patrick? Yeah, and uh, and it's cool, Michael. We met for the first time uh, in Nashville, but we've seen each other all over social media, and it's kind of how small this industry is. Um, and it was really cool to see you in person. I'm glad you're a real person, and uh, you're taller. <laughs> you're way taller than I thought, uh, which <laughs> kind of took me by surprise. But uh, but it was really fun. But just a little bit of background on me, uh, Michael, is um, you know. My, my background is very tech oriented um, and, and I started companies when I was really young. So, you know, I was very entrepreneurial. I had a very entrepreneurial urge really young. I know when, when I was 12 years old, 10 to 12, uh, kids would get super excited about snowstorms. Speaking of snowstorm right now in New York happening, and I would get super excited, but for a different reason. I saw while wow, people saw, oh my God, it's going to be a day off. It's going to be great to play in the snow and make snowmen. I was thinking, wow, this is going to be awesome time to make some money snow plowing. And that was kind of the journey of knowing that I was a little bit different than everyone else uh, in, a, in a little way that I just valued creating value and, and making cash, to be honest. Um, I thought this was really cool. It was going to give me access to live a more enjoyable life, to yeah. eat the food I wanted to eat. And, you know, my parents, grew, we grew up in a middle class family. It's I never got handed anything, so I had to if I wanted an Xbox, I had to make money for it. And so that's, you know, that was the way that I had to do it. And so, you know, from a really young age, I, I saw that opportunity and was able to to create value like that. So uh, that was the, the 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 beginning of my life. And slowly as time went on, um, 14 years old, I was really passionate about video games. Uh, I love video games and and you can turn anything, anything you're passionate about into a money making machine because Eventually, I started seeing my friends really like video games too, and they needed server space to host their um, servers on. And naturally, I decided, you know what? I'm going to host for free. This is the early version of house hacking. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to host for free and get my stuff, my my servers paid for by other people. So I'm going to sp- I'm going to get a big server. I'm going to split the server into segments. I'm going to dish it out to other people to pay for it, and I made money on top of that. So I made money and I got to play for free. I was like, this awesome. is awesome. And eventually I scaled that and I made around $40,000 a year until I was 18 years old uh, in high school. Amazing. And um, that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. That's who I'm about. And and I've loved it ever since. <laughs> so so from getting your video games paid for and, you know, high school, high school sounds like it was fairly enjoyable at 40K a year as a as in high school. Oh, yeah. It's funny, I, I kind of, I've heard this story actually from from a few people um, that are now you know short term investors and entrepreneurs in general. Like it all starts really early. You know, you kind of just have this itch when you're younger, uh, whether it's like genetics or like circumstances. Like who knows? Maybe a combination right. of both. But yeah, it's just like that, that early urge for something entrepreneur. I actually don't really talk about it, but like yeah, I, my my buddy and I in high school, we, I mean, this was like 1996, so dating myself a little bit, but it's like the you know advent of the internet and. Uh, we actually found an opportunity for like affiliate marketing and then we falling backwards to do it. We're like, Oh, you get paid if people click on this, like five cents or eight cents or like you get paid if someone buys something from the link. You're like, all right, well, how do we like create a bunch of these links and like spam? <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> how, how do we distribute a lot of links, uh, at scale? Um, we did that actually, uh, for, 
and that paid for high that I paid for through a lot of high school and paid for a lot of college. So um, yeah, like all, all this stuff starts early. But now, like like we're, uh, today, like tell us about your short term real estate business slash portfolio today. How's it look like? Yeah, yeah. So I do want to kind of I'll skip some steps, but uh, I did kind of where I got first introduced to short term rental investing per se in the portfolio that I have today. I currently have five properties um, currently and I own and then I manage, well, total 53 signed in Joshua, California. So that's the way it is. But I got introduced to short term rental investing um, right after I went down the path of college. I realized I got into no schools uh, in the beginning and I realized, wow, creating real value in this world, not being an entrepreneur doesn't really pay off when it comes to the workforce. So I thought, you know, great, I'm going to go get straight A's and I'm going to get into a top university. I went to community college, got straight A's, got into University of Illinois, top 10 business school, got straight A's, 4.0, 3.98, got one A minus. Oh boy. Uh, and then I graduated, you know, high honors, did everything they told me. And then I got a job uh, working for a short-term rental company as a product manager in LA. And the company happens to be a short-term rental company that manages, they do arbitrage at scale. And uh, it's called Avanste. You know, they're a top 10 property management company now. And uh, at the time, they were doing arbitrage. And, and I, that's where I really learned how much money short-term rentals really can make. Uh, that was kind of the first ringing to that. Long story short, laid me off during COVID. Things happened. Tried going down the traditional path. Uh, got fired from three jobs in one year. Couldn't really hold the job. I was always questioning everything. I was always, you know, I was not a good employee. I was questioning everything. I wanted to know what's going on. I loved managing people, but I didn't really like being managed. So it just, it just never really worked out for me. But then eventually fell on short-term rentals. I was like, I really want to do this thing. I really want to do short-term. Yeah. And I said, screw it. I'm just going to buy one. I couldn't figure out how to arbitrage. I couldn't figure out how to host. I was like, I have to buy it. So I used all the money that I had at the time that I've saved up and, and, you know, I pay for college and all sorts of other things, but, um, all the money I saved up and I put down 10% at the age of 24, put down 10% on a home in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. That was my first property that I ever bought. Very nice. And put 10% down. It was 2021 and good time uh, to be buying the Smokies. We have six there. So. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. So mm. that was the start of everything. The Smokies and everyone talked about it. Avery Carl, it was like this huge thing, and I thought, you know what? If I if they could do it, I can do it. So I put the money down, and I did not know what I was doing. I did a sight unseen, bought the studio prop studio cabin that was making thirty three thousand dollars a year. I just I put all in, all in. I was at like forty two thousand. After everything, it was a standard property. And the only thing I changed was the marketing and the pricing. And that alone took this property from 33,000 to 60,000. I made 60,000 that first year. That was like where I realized, wow, I can, uh, bad managers actually don't make as much money as good managers. Yeah. As health managed it. And I was like, wow, this is, there's a huge opportunity here. Amazing. Yeah. No, the, uh, yeah. I mean, 2021 Smokies, is uh -huh. a, a lot of, yeah, that could be a lot of people that self manage or use property management companies that really not optimize for price. I always tell like that is the that is the low hanging fruit in this industry is revenue management, pricing management, the pricing and listing optimization. Actually, um, some of the listings are just really awful too. Actually, and it can't really doesn't take very long to fix it. Photos, descriptions, whatnot, and then pricing. Like you could literally like you know thirty percent someone's revenue that's like really mismanaging it like really really easily without like too much of a too much of a sweat actually we've actually now helped a few people in the smokies do that too on, on revenue they just kind of come ask us like hey how much are you making like we have a, we have a uh, six bedroom rented they're like 215 nice. no view or anything it's just like uh game room two hot tubs but two hot tubs in there actually or it came with two hot tubs and we're like oh, let's keep it and they're like they're their six bedrooms are doing like like 140 and like what if, sometimes they have a view or a better location I'm like what like what are you guys doing <laughs> wow like just change your pricing and then yeah like so um anyways this is for a, a bit of a digression uh but there's a lot of value to managing it properly so 
back to yours. So you were you bought the one in the smoke is twenty one. So right. I guess you I'm guessing you ten thirty one or sold it to go into J Tree. Joshua right. Tree. So I, I just flat out sold it. Um pulled out hundred and seventy five thousand dollars of cash. Uh that was in a year and a half. And I mean, at the time I was already doing stuff in Joshua Tree. I had a business partner that was putting up the capital and I was doing all the work. So, you know, kind of uh, the aspect of, you know, I was 24, 25 at the time. I didn't really have that much cash. I didn't work, you know, a uh, 100K plus job or anything like that for very long. I wasn't a really good employee to be to begin with. But um, you got to be resourceful, right? So, you know, found somebody that, you know, wanted to. How'd you find this person, actually? Sorry, curious. Well, so so for was... younger listeners out there, people that don't have mm-hmm. access to a lot of capital, like what's yeah. a way to do that? Like you partnered with someone that had the money, didn't have the time. You had right. at the time a lot more free time versus capital. I'm sure it's different now, but how'd you find a person? Like, How'd you structure a deal with them? Yeah, so this was in, um, so I was at a meetup and it was like a mutual friend. Okay. And okay. I met him and he was doing, he was flipping houses and I, w- I had one Airbnb at the time and he, he, he was like, I want to get into Airbnb. I said, well, I would love some capital so that we can both do it together. And, um, and we kind of partnered up and it's funny cause to this day we're still partners. Um, oh, we nice. do the Very management cool. company together. We're buying management companies together. Um, so it's, it's been very nice. And, uh, at the time, yeah, I, you know, got that, got access to capital. And then from there we took on these deals together and, um, and that helped cause that allowed me to do five deals pretty quickly. And, uh, and I sold, you know, the cabin in the Smokies. So yeah. once I had the regret cow, selling the cow, do you regret selling the cow in the stock? Well, I'm so you, happy I did that because keep in mind, um, there's a, I had a 3% interest rate, which is kind of hard to give up, but, uh, think about this, right? There's this thing called ROE, which is return on equity. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Have you ever heard of I ROE? Have. Okay. So I was, in, I, was, I was invested bank over 10 years. I, yeah. That's like oh, okay, very, yeah. Like, what okay, is your, okay. yeah. Like what, what is your return on equity? Yeah. Your equity has <laughs> increased materially from when you bought it. If you put in 40, you got 175 out, you have exactly. four extra equity. So then your returns, if they were 20%, they're on their 5%. So yeah. I shouldn't even ask you that question. Of course, you know, <laughs> um, sorry. It's our- like, you know, like, it's like, you threw, you threw like red beat at me. I was like, ah, I guess I gotta, I'll go for it. I love I love how you're sitting there just so humbly, not trying to say it, but you know it. Um, but but yeah, so ROE, um, return on equity. That money was just sitting there. It was not make it was making twenty k a year net, uh, cash in the pocket. I knew that I can make more money with active investments, so I took that money and I made more money just through one flip. Yet alone, you know, buying another management company and doing other things with it. So I, I've been very happy with that cash. And to this day, it's been serving me well. And so that just multiplies the money a lot faster. Um, and doubling down in one area. I'm a very big proponent of doubling down in one area. Economies of scale, similar to your six. I mean, how are your six in the Smoky Mountains? I'm sure the fact that once you got to the third one, fourth one, it became marginally less difficult to to kind of manage, right? Yeah, no, I mean, much easier. So we have the arbitrage portfolio in Philly, so like 25 there. So we kind of had the back end all the tech back in and the customer service. Um, and then when we bought the cabins, yeah, we had to learn a new market, obviously, and then the vendors and all that fun stuff. Uh, but yeah, by the, our first three, there were the same HOA. So it, the same HOA. So like as kind of easy as you can get it, right? Like we knew what it could do and we used the same cleaners. Our fourth one was, yeah, the fourth one was like kind of down the street, maybe like 10 minutes down. So like pretty close. You know, the, the next one, next two are a little further away. But yeah, I definitely, I'm with you there. I'm very much a proponent of having scale within one place. So all of our arbitrage units are in Philly, like right. two buildings. And then all of our cabins are like in Severville. So Smokies are, there's some sub markets in, in the Smokies, but we try to keep everything within, you know, 20 minutes of each other. Same cleaners, just same everything. Yeah, uh, same same handyman, same same handyman, same mattresses, same TVs, and the same remotes, same locks, same lights, <laughs> and, and like as much as the can. same as we, you know, we yeah. and there. And, I mean, we both know there's real advantages to standardization when you, when you start growing your unit count. Yeah. Oh no, I agree for sure. How do you how do you deal with that the with the mansion company? So you you manage is that fifty three right now? Sorry, right. right. Mm-hmm. Like. Or maybe maybe let's like rewind a little bit. So you got the five, you, you bought five, 
and was co was like managing slash co-hosting always kind of part of the equation like i'm gonna get these here but i'm gonna just kind of grow or is it like more organic like how, how did you how did that come about yeah so i wasn't thinking about co-hosting uh i thought that that was not the way to wealth uh at the beginning at least and i realized that having cash flow is so important which is why you like the arbitrage i'm assuming um, so a lot of people will invest and then the money will, will just kind of stay into the properties. will just stay there as opposed to like having that cash somewhere else where you can make more money on that cash. Um, that's kind of more the, the way to go where you can actually multiply the efforts. So like flipping houses, doing active investing, like, you know, co-hosting. So, uh, I, I decided I'm running out of cash and, and honestly, like I can't keep taking loans out and I just I just knew that I was I was at a point where I needed to to make some cash like income and so what better way to do it than manage other people's properties I already I was already doing it I was already teaching at the time keep in mind at the time STR Nation started so um STR Nation is my community of of short-term rental investors and I was already teaching people how to buy and get properties under contract and all that kind of stuff um and so I thought to myself well if I teach other people to do it, I can just do it myself and I can manage these. And so I was looking for co-host leads and turns out a somebody was looking to sell 15 at the time, uh, at the same time. And so they were looking to sell their management company. And that's kind of where my journey came into buying management companies. I've bought two so far and I'm in escrow on my third one. So that's more of an advanced topic. Uh, but you know, I've definitely I definitely love the aspect of like buying into cash flow as opposed to just, you know, going one by one. Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we, why don't we double click on that? Cause I know that's something that you're, you're, you're very, you've been very public about, about buying management companies. Like, I mean, they're just to level set, you know, the short term rentals, there's three. If you're like a first time listener or haven't listened to many episodes, there are three key strategies. Um, what is co-hosting, which is just another way for property management. You manage someone else's property for a fee, right? You, you know, and it's generally like a percentage, 15 to 25%, depending on the market um, and or how good you are of a negotiator. Uh, second is uh, rental arbitrage. And I kind of, I'll just go through the order of like um, capital intensity. Managing is like, doesn't cost a ton of money. Um, it's really just, you're doing work, right? You're, you're training, you're, you're training labor for, for income. Um, rental arbitrage is kind of similar, but you're more of an owner. You pay a rent. You pay a fixed payment a month to rent someone's property, but you're responsible for all the expenses and furnishing it and doing everything. Um, but you get all the upside, right? Like if you crush it, then you make everything uh, besides your expenses. Downside is if you don't crush it, then you owe the rent or, you know, you're, you know, you could be in a lost position. It's probably pretty difficult to be in a lost position for, um, for co-hosting. Although your upside is capped because you're sharing a percent, you know, you have a you know 20% right. of the income versus a hundred percent. The last is, uh, is buying, right? You buy it's 10, 20% down, you get a mortgage, you got to put in the furniture. It's, you know, it's a fair amount of money. And, you know, to Patrick's point, if you, if it appreciates like that property of Smokies that we bought, like there's a ton of equity in that. And the ROA there is like not great. Now, you know, there's a 3% mortgage there. I could wrap something around it, but like also like that's also an advanced topics category. Uh, right. but that's where, you know, so there's three the key strategies. I think Patrick has like, been very clever and like finding a way to like scale a co-hosting business because generally speaking people will go especially being about like one by one like their friends who are under their their network around them like hey you want to buy one i'll manage it for you right that's how people usually start but it's hard it takes a long time it's like one by one by one versus buying a company you're buying a portfolio of leads there's different nuances there too right so patrick maybe, maybe talk about that because that's something that i've never really talked about and actually don't really know much about so I know the M&A side, um, but I'm um, curious on how you think about, like, how you think about this, um, scaling your co-hosting business by buying management companies versus, you know, kind of going to individual owners one by one. Yeah. I mean, the, the thought process there for me, at least now, is going one by one, I'll, I'll touch on that in a sec, but like versus buying a property and getting all the uh, appreciation and all the tax benefits. It really doesn't make as much sense when you're really starting out because the tax benefits is, you know, when you're a high income earner, essentially, right? So, like, if you're starting out, you don't really have a crazy high income, it makes more sense to buy into cash flow. So, I'd rather take that same cash and instead of get, buying a property that's going to make me a thousand a month, I'd rather buy a management company that's going to make me a thousand dollars per property. So, that those 15 properties, a thousand dollars per property puts me at 15 grand. If I hire out staff, 
you know, plus expenses. That could be like 10 grand, you know, seven and a half. Like I'd rather get that per month than have one property essentially. Um, mm-hmm. But with that comes more difficulties, obviously. Now, now one by one wait, wait, versus- Can I, can I talk, can you, can you talk yeah. about that though? Because I think, you know, there is this like romanticism of like, 15 properties, great. You earn more cash. But there is, yeah. you know, like just like with anything, right? Anything in life, there's like the good and the bad, right? Pros like and the cons, right? Yeah, the pros and the cons, right? It, th- thank you. Like, yeah, yeah. talk about, I mean, just like high level, like what are the cons of managing 15, like versus one? Yeah, one is a lot less stress. You can work, you can self manage it, uh, you know, and, and do, use like 30 minutes a week and that's it. And once you get to 15, first of all, you're managing other people's properties. So you're dealing with the owners, which is probably honestly the biggest PETA or pain in the butt uh, <laughs> is PETA. dealing with owners. <laughs> and uh, you don't have to do that with arbitrage. You don't have to deal with owners. So that's the cool thing about you, Michael. Um, but for, for co-hosting, you have to deal with owners. So that's one of the bad things. Um, not not all owners are bad, but they have expectations and and you have to you know cater to your expectations. They have they're going to be complaining about things. They're going to be talking. You have to really set the expectation correctly and, and really talk, yeah. about it, which is especially with new owners, it can be really tough. Now, once you get into 15, you're dealing with 15 of them. And then on top of that, you're dealing with all these issues and all these properties. It's just a lot of stuff going on at once. Um, but the cool thing there is like if you own properties and you manage properties for other people, then you can actually use the resources from the management company, the co-host company to help your property that you own. So all the resources, let's say the handyman or whatever, you can actually pay for the handyman to go in full time in your company. And then now you have free handyman services for your one property that you own. So you see like there's there's unique ways to do all of that. Yeah. So that's kind of the the idea around it. And um, you hit on head the, uh, the owner management part. That is like by far the hardest part. Um, yeah. And like, that for me is actually the biggest reason why I won't like I, we've done it like two people here in New York City they're like wealthy individuals that like really not, are not going to care to just like handle it send me a check like I don't really know I don't want to know like I just I, like, I actually don't really want to know I'm like great <laughs> for me client and they're condos so like you know I don't have any issues but anyways um, the fact that like 15 people have my cell phone number and like blow me up whenever like that like scares me and that's where like the arbitrage there's more risk but like you know you kind of there's like one person out call you and yeah and you pay them and i think it's also like you pay them money the power di- the power dynamics a little different too it's like i'm the tenant though <laughs> like yeah they could yell at me for something but also like i pay you rent versus like the other way around where it's like yeah well like you know like who's the client and i always going to think of it in, the, in, in that terms but look i mean not having to have a huge rent not beginning of every single month is like that's very um, comforting. And also, like, there's more value if you were to sell a management company. They're just like you're buying a management company. There's more value there. Arbitrage businesses are, like, not easy to sell. Management companies, like, you'll get, you know, like, depending on the size and quality of the business, you'll get a multiple on, on your cash flow. Three to 5x, so, usually. Um, and it could be higher depending on your contracts and everything that you have going yeah. on. So, so just, um, yeah. So, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was I was agreeing with you. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. So that those are the pros and cons of co-hosting. Co-hosting is like, like you said, there's no downside in the sense that like if sometimes I make more money than my owners, you know, it's like crazy, but it's not ideal. But there's mar- times in the market where it gets tough and especially with mortgages. But, you know, def- I don't get the benefits of the real estate. So there's yeah, a con. Um, but at the same time, the cool thing, so there's with every con, there's always... When there's a will, there's a way. So there's I'm on this podcast and my phone's not blowing up right now. So uh, you know, there's I'm at, and I'm at 53. So how is that? And so it's like hiring a team, right? Just like with anything in life, um, we have somebody dealing just with owners. That's how that's how much work the owner and same with like fund managers, I'm sure have the same experience where they're dealing with all these personalities where where, you know, it's it was somebody's money. Like dealing people's most prized possession or like highest investment, which is their assets, their their homes. You know, usually there's a lot of money stuck in these homes, so it's like it's a big deal, especially if it's a yeah. homeowner. So, yeah. and this, they poured every little dollar into this thing called Airbnb because they're going to make a lot of money with this thing, and and they're super t- uptight about making sure that it's good, and they rely heavily on it. That's why I like working with investors more so. Yeah. That's just more numbers driven, uh, easier to communicate with, especially ones that uh, bought good deals. Uh, there's you know, <laughs> some, room, some room on the deal. 
Uh, they're not like scavenging to 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 make ends meet. So we we look more like uh, uh, somebody that's co- coming and saving them from from everything versus somebody that's taking away uh, money from them. That's a huge. By the way, that, that's a, I want to pull that out. That's actually huge. Like I think for almost anything, like you know, if you if someone sees you as like a value adding to their their project, their house, whatever it is, like it is a way easier conversation, a way better relationship than. Yeah, sometimes those owners or just just in general where you feel they feel like you're taking from them. It's like, well, you don't deserve twenty percent. Like I could do this. Um, yeah. I don't know if you met Rob near uh Nerdorf in in uh Yeah, I did. In, yeah. And he's just every time I see him, it's like, man, like these owners like <laughs> I go man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> you gotta find yeah, you gotta find someone to uh, buffer between that. But um that is actually really if yeah. you can like build those relationships, those are the best ones because those compound over time, and they're like, oh my god, it's like a pleasure yeah. to do business. It's a pleasure to be, we talk I about. It, it's that. like, yeah, it's like a very enjoyable conversation versus like yeah. someone calls you and is like, I wanted to be eighteen percent, not nineteen percent. <laughs> you're like, oh my god, over like, a percentage point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so we vet our owners just like we vet the house. We vet the owners and. Uh, Michael, I'm going to be honest, there is an asshole tax. So if uh, you're a tough owner to deal with, you know, we're going to charge you 30% um, or you can kick rocks, you know, because at the end of the day, um, if I'm going to have to deal with something that's really tough to deal with, I'm going to, I'm going to charge them more. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's always that um, perspective on things. But anyways, yeah, I I love the cool thing about this business though, is the owners as well, because you get connected to some, you know, pretty cool people. They're doing cool things. And a lot of times they already trust you because you manage yeah. the properties for them. So they'll want to do deals with you. So they'll, you know, propose, Hey, like, let's take down this commercial building or do this thing. Or, Hey, um, do you guys want to, you know, do help us with this? Or it, it, you just get more opportunities because these are high net worth individuals that are investing in these more luxury assets, especially for the luxury houses or they're like musicians or they're famous people. We're near LA. So we get a lot of like, we have celebrity clients. So uh, you get some cool perks with that, which, you know, very cool are fun. And I'm sure if I, if I all do the privacy, I won't drop their names, but um, you know, it's, it's cool. Like they'll, they'll definitely um, like have people stay at the properties that you would, you would be like, wow, I know that person like a list. <laughs> so that's cool. cool. That's very cool. Um, so, let's, talk, yeah. let's talk about Joshua tree actually, because it's actually one of the, um, yeah. I do want to hit uh, STR nation because um, yeah. I think it's really important. I think the community part is actually super important for people that are, Oh yeah. Just starting out or don't have a broad network like it's really valuable to find a, a group a tribe that like you can like talk to and share problems with like uh, create solutions together it's super valuable um so i, want, I definitely want to talk about that but how's joshua tree right now um you know i think there's you hear different things online so you're at, you have 58 right because right. you're 53 plus five yeah. so Oh no, not plus what? five, fifty-three total. Oh, 53 total. Yeah, 53. Yeah. So yeah, 50, you're you're above fifty. Um, yeah, you have a pretty good view on the market. Like, what's the market like now? How was it twenty-three, and how are you thinking about twenty-four? Yeah, so interesting enough, um, I'm I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Joshua Tree is the best market to enter into. I I would not I would actually not advise most newbie investors to invest in Joshua Tree unless they have a trusted advisor that understands the market really really well, and it's super competitive. I'm just going to be honest; it's super competitive. And it's, you know, it's why near, is it super competitive? I mean, th- yeah. why, like, what, like, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like define yeah. that actually. So super competitive in the sense that there's a lot of really good properties out there and the competition, okay. diff, uh, everyone uses automated price or everyone uses uh, dynamic pricing. You're not special for using it. Uh, everyone's listed on multiple platforms. Everybody does the highest end amenities and the highest end design. Okay. You, everyone does a hot tub. Now everyone's doing a Callaway pool. Like the, the standards are so high. The interior design is so elevated. You can, like, if you have a grandma chic house, forget about it. You're not going to get anything. Like the, you're, you're dead. Um, and so it's like, <laughs> oh, wow. It's, Scary, it's actually. So I feel like yeah. right now I'm in the NBA, Michael. I'm, I'm here. I'm just like, you know, um, pulling moves. And then I want to play some college ball. I want to go to, you know, michigan or something and like compete over there <laughs> but i can't you know i'm here and i'm in olympics and and so it's great because it prepares me because i have to be on top of everything i have to measure ranking for all the properties i have to price every single day i need like specific attention and revenue management which honestly makes me a better competitor in a lot of ways but i will tell you michael there's nothing better than being in a market where i have the demand i have the traffic flow 
right? I rather I rather be in a place where I don't have to compete to convince people to go out there and visit the area. I rather take the existing traffic, the 3 million visitors that come to the national park every year and basically captivate on that audience, just do better than my neighbor. I rather do yeah. better than my neighbor and have traffic flow than not have traffic flow. You see yeah. No, totally, um, totally. Yeah, I'd be happy to demand, you know, like you you just, you know, there's business there. You have to you're fighting for business yeah. versus like creating business, right? Like I think that's oh yeah. I think that's where some of the some people have gotten in trouble um like in twenty two, twenty three. They're investing in these like tertiary markets. And I was telling people not to do that. Like there's always, you know, when it was so busy during COVID, people couldn't afford to go into kind of the core where they wanted to go to. So they would go a little, maybe twenty minutes out, thirty minutes out, an hour and out. And those saw a big spike. And you're like, oh my God, this is great. They're, these properties are so cheap. They made so much money. Uh, uh, now, a lot, of that, a lot of that mean reversion's happening. Um, so it's always good to, I always appreciate this. It's always good to like stay in that core market. The, like, there's two things in real estate you can't, so, so, Metro taught me this. There's two things in real estate you can't change. Location, can't move it, and price, your basis. Those things you cannot change, right? The price you got in at and where you bought it. Now, you can... You know, you can refi your loan, you can, you know, tear down and build a new house, like whatever it is, right? But like the land is the land, the location is the location, and the price is the price. So you get those two things right, like, you know, you're generally in a good spot. Um, so it's good. I mean, it's not, you know, we're, we're aligned there. It's uh, it's definitely better to be in a good, you know, you sound like in a solid location there. I saw this like glass house on YouTube about, yep, I think it was a tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm like, wow, like, this is really elevated. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah do you think it's just because it's the la kind of style and money and that's just like you know and that's how that's why this market's evolved do you think I, that is i 100 think it's san francisco la san diego california money getting dumped into that market and people are always going to one up you and there's just better and better properties and so that's that's actually a cool opportunity too because people then buy like a four bedroom just sold for 1.7 million, which was a record. That was a new construction. Um, and you know, those kind of opportunities happen because people just have money in San Francisco. You can get a shack in San Francisco for that kind of money. And then now you can buy a, a beautiful home in Joshua tree for that kind of money. So is it mostly like a second home market or is it, do you think they're mostly investors or like someone that, you know, made a lot of money in tech or, or in the media industry and just wants a nice second home, that yeah. like they can go to there's a factor here like people just want to be able to like show off to their friends to like look at my beautiful house and then airbnb you know if it's you know kind of like cover some of the costs great if not like they don't really care although those markets kind of scare me though because like they're so price insensitive and like they can be kind of outlandish with the uh amenities like if you're striving for cash on cash like you know it's just gonna be really really tough i'm curious oh, yeah. you're you know, you're needing that you're knee deep in that market how do you think about that? Or that's an interesting perspective, Michael. Like, yeah, like that's actually something that I think about all the time. I'm like, dang, I'm gonna have to renew these homes every two years because like everyone's always one upping each other and doing better and better. And I think that actually drives tourism up. And so I think a rising tide lifts all ships. And I believe in that. So like the fact that I'm already positioned well at a lower price point, I think the valuation of these assets go up. And I think the value of the market as a whole, like when you have quality of properties, then that just increases value and increases tourism to those areas. A perfect example of this is the Gulf Shores with Bill Faith. He talks about this whole concept when he first went into Gulf Shores, uh, golf carts were not an amenity that was offered. But um, next door, uh, I don't know next door exactly what it is, but I think like Further down, like Destin and and all that, like yeah, that was a norm, right? These high end homes, this is a norm to do. But in Alabama, this is not really a thing. But he started doing it. People started copying him, and it started becoming more and more elevated as a market. And because of that, everyone won because more tourism started flocking to that market because the standard of the home went up. And I know that there's people that don't go to Joshua Tree and go to Palm Springs because Palm Springs has an elevated experience that's very like, you know what you're going to get no matter where you go in Palm Springs, you're going to get a very high quality product, um, which is what people are striving for. And Joshua Tree is not the way yet, just yet, but it's being becoming more elevated. The middle is getting squeezed out. The shitty products are getting squeezed out. The Coles of the world, the Sears of the world are where you're not competing on value or price. You're just getting squeezed. 
And so, you know, you got to compete on those two avenues. Uh, and I'll be honest, I never want to compete on price because competing on price is a falling knife. And you're gonna, if you want the Walmart strategy, you can go all day, but I'm all about value and um, uh, and competing on differentiating, like differentiating. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you sound like you, you sound like the product manager that you started at the, the, <laughs> a, the a plus uh, the four yeah. the three four nine eight uh, oh, GPA uh, uh, product manager at Avance. No, that's great. I think the way that you described and, it is is excellent. Um, I went to Joshua Tree one time. I loved it actually. I I, I love the desert. Um, and my wife and I went there. I would. Like I can't wait to take my kids. That's actually one of the places I really want to take my kids first trip because I, it's just like you, you know, it's like open. It's like really easy. I got young kids. I want them to have like an easy, you know, like they can just run hang around. out. Yeah, yeah, they can run around and you know we'll go when it's not like not super super hot. But like that's, it, it's it's a great it's a great place to uh, it's a great place to spend some time. Well, you have a um, you have a place to to stay now because I you know well, you got you. your choice of whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. That's very kind of you. Um definitely hit you up and uh help me find a good place for the fam but um i, I do like we have a few minutes left i, I want to hit on str nation um because actually i don't know much about it I, you know i've seen our mutual friend jeremy i went to your event i think it was, yeah, i guess last year uh i had never heard about it and i looked at it and i was like oh this is really cool it's in san diego which is uh where i went to college so i was in right. san diego so Wait, where'd you tell go? us more about uh, uh ucsd oh ucsd cool, cool yeah, cool, yeah, cool. yeah yeah you had Sport a really years. fun time then huh <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's it's not the not easiest yeah it's a it, it's fun but it, it this is 98 so it's definitely uh, it was more fun then now it's like a real like very rigorous academic school um <laughs> but tell like but you know like tell us about how you started that um just with the podcast and you know trying to build a community around kind of what what liz and i have started just so many good opportunities and it, it's actually more enjoyable because i meet a lot of other people that like are doing the same thing that i would never would have met and like i learn from them and like yeah. it's just kind of cool to talk shop um but i'd love to know let me start like how'd you where'd you get the idea of str nation yeah so good question so this is gonna this is gonna be helpful for anybody that's looking to get started in um real estate investing when i got started uh remember going back to the home uh how did i get the courage to buy a home two thousand miles away without sight unseen and and knowing that smoky markets was a good market community I, I had no idea until I saw other people that are doing it and they were telling me about it. And they're like, wow, look at these returns. Look at what's going on here. Uh, we're from California too, and we're doing this. And so I, from an early start, I realized community was an important aspect of my investing journey. And it, it allows me to push beyond my limits, right? It allows me to push and become better and better. And so knowing that, that's why I decided, you know what? I'm going to start my own little meetup in, in LA. So I had my first meetup, 15 people came. Uh, 10 to 15. That's pretty good. It's like That's 10 to 15 good. or something. And yeah. I was like, cool. This is so cool. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm doing this meetup. And so I did it the next month. I saw Stephanie, my business partner currently on STR Nation. And she came again. And then this time she had another property. The first time she had only one. Now she next month she had another one. It seemed like every month or every other month she got like a new property. And I was like, dang, she's scaling so fast. And like it, it motivated me to try to scale as fast as with her. And so like both me and her now uh, run STR Nation and we've grown it. And we've, you know, within six months, we decided, hey, let's just put on a conference in, in Vegas. Let's make it happen. Okay. And 150 person conference, we fully booked out 150 people. Uh, and then we said, you know what, let's do 250. And we fully booked out 250 last year. And now we're saying, let's do 250 again. Let's do it in San Diego again. And, and I haven't released it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll release the dates, save the dates. July 7th to the 9th, we're doing it in San Diego again. Very so, nice. Um, so we just do it every year, but we do meetups every month in LA, which is cool. Um, but I want to join everybody in together, you know, for for every every year. And so that's that's the one coming up in San Diego. All right. So this is July 7th to 9th, if you're in San Diego or in you know, yeah. Southern California, uh, you're interested in short-term rentals, definitely good to check what, it out what's funny michael um yeah. we haven't talked about this but you're definitely on the list of people that i have to reach out to uh, for speaking opportunities <laughs> so you. um so granted uh i'm just doing it this is the first time michael's hearing about it but um I'm, might as well do live if you want to come speak this would be a really great opportunity i'd love to have you on the panel uh you know for co-hosting and arbitrage i think it'd be really fun that we can we can talk shop about arbitrage yeah uh, yeah i'd I'd love to, I love talking shop and I love San Diego. So it's and, a pretty, it's a pretty easy, uh, how good. Yeah. On top of that, I think this would be a fantastic way 
to make your dreams come a reality. And what you can do is you can go to San Diego and then right afterwards you can go to <laughs> the country. But it might be exactly. triple digit. Uh, it's kind of hot. That, yeah, I don't, hot. I don't. Yeah, maybe we'll go up. To, maybe we'll go up like <laughs> Laguna or something. <laughs> we'll say we'll say, we'll save Joshua Tree for the you know. Right. Local. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> But thank you. No, that's uh, no. Thank you. I I would love to do that. That's, that sounds like a wonderful opportunity. I appreciate the offer. Um, so fo- you know, folks, July seventh and ninth in, in San Diego. If you're listening to this, uh, you know, buy your tickets at Steering Nation. Go check it out. Um, but let's talk about let's, let's talk about the meetup though. Like, I'm curious. Did you just like have like did you just run a bar or, or like did you just like hey let's meet up here? Like how like I think a lot of people are, are maybe a little cautious about like. I think a lot of people are kind of scared. They just want to go and they don't know. Any, like, if you don't know anyone or you're not a buddy right. to go with you, you kind of just go there. You're not kind of like, get your light, get your hiding kid and you just sit in the corner. You don't really know what to say. Yeah. You, you know, especially if you're new, you don't really have anything to contribute. It's awkward to go in a circle of people that already know each other. So, like, how do you think about that? Like, where do you have it? And how do you, like, get, how do you make new people comfortable where they want to, you yeah. know, contribute? I think a lot of it's just I'm, I'm loud and I'm obnoxious, so I'm going to run around and connect people. Um, but a uh, second part, so a long time ago when I was 18, um, a long time How ago, old are you? You keep a long time ago. You look <laughs> like you're like 24, 25. I'm, 20, I'm 27, so so it wasn't that long ago, <laughs> but relatively to my life. Um, you're a young man. You're, you're, young, okay. you're a young man, my friend. <laughs> Nine years ago. Um, <laughs> but, but when I did that, my mentor told me you should go to networking events. So I did that. I went downtown because I live 30 minutes away from Chicago, downtown. And I, I went downtown 30 minutes on a train. I got my little business cards I bought online for dollars, pennies on a dollar. Vista and, print? And that's, yeah, Vista print or Moo.com. Uh, and then I uh, I got inside. Moo.com, yeah. I think Moo.com had free cards. That's what I got. Yeah. Like <laughs> I think we used that um, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so like I did that. And then I got in. And I was so intimidated that I chickened out. I literally left. First of all, I was like, oh, it's a bar. They're not going to let me in. I'm not even of age. And I just ran out and went to the pizza joint next door. And I called my mentor. And I talked to him and he said, listen, everybody, everybody in that room is there for a reason. Find out that reason. When you think from the perspective that everyone there." is going to network for a reason. There's a reason that if they, if they had everything figured out in their life, they wouldn't be there. So you have something of value to offer them, or you can at least listen to what they need and you might be able to connect them correctly. And when I thought of that, I was like, wow, these people aren't, I'm not taking away anything from these people. Yeah. If anything, I can add value to these people. And so that kind of switched the ship and I actually went over to the, to the meetup and, and I got in, even though I was 18, it was 21 plus bar. And they handed me a wine. I was like, ah, uh, and I just, okay, full disclosure. I started drinking the wine. Uh, <laughs> but, and they don't know. They think everyone there is 21 plus, you know? So, yeah. and I started networking and, and def- the wine definitely helped, but um, calmed my nerves, but um, got to talk to some people and uh, it was great. I, that was, from there, I've always used that same philosophy. So yeah, yeah no, I'm in, you know? <laughs> No, no, I think I think that's. I just want to reiterate that. Like, I think that's great, and I think you we t- we touched on that on a couple other points, and you know where where you're not thinking about taking, where it's not like right. taking, you're giving, right? Yeah. And like you're giving value to someone, just makes the whole relationship easier. It's easier to right. start. It's easier to maintain. It's easier to like grow because like everyone's getting something out of it, right? Like the the, the tough ones are always the ones where one person's winning. When we're thinking about partnerships and stuff, I always think about win wins. Like, how can I help this person? Like. If, if it's helping me like how does this help the other person because if fundamentally like i'm winning and someone else is losing like you might win that once or twice right at least definitely in entrepreneurship like you maybe win once or twice but like it'll never it's not a sustainable relationship and they're actually the hardest things to do in business is like having good sustainable long-term relationships those are the ones that like really add value to you long term because they're like so rare actually um if you're if you're a person that like people like and like add value to them like, there's such a premium of being nice and being liked in entrepreneurship because like you'll get opportunities that you will not you you, you don't even know exists actually because they happen in rooms and conversations where you're not there where the person is like yeah i'm in a conversation about joshua tree it's like I, you know it's like oh yeah actually but i know this guy actually that has like 53 problems out there you should just talk to him like i don't know but you should at least talk to him and for someone like that it's actually really valuable it's like yeah it's a lead that you never would have known but it's like you have a conversation it might not go anywhere but it might and then for me, it's like I connected to people that like, you know, mutually benefited from interaction and 
those are the things that I think everyone should like look for. And I think these network events are, are super valuable. So hundred um, percent folks. Yeah. Like definitely mm-hmm. go out and don't be scared. Just think about, yeah, just think about it in the context that, that Patrick, uh, just described it. So it's a really, really useful yeah. framework. Um, as we went out of conversation, I'm gonna ask my final question that I ask all my guests, um, like this is, like we just talked about it's a team sport and not gonna be successful without others in your corner and actively helping you. Like what was one of the kindest things that someone's done for you in your business journey? Could be like in the, from the very beginning to now. Um, what was one of the kindest things that someone did for you that's really helped you get to where you are today? I think um, I think the kindest thing is definitely uh, my business partner that offered the capital, right? So Josh um, decided to take a bet on me and decided, you know what? I, I see something in this guy. I think that he's going to do really well. And he he put his money where his mouth is. And now we own a management company together. I've given, I, I believe that I've given him a lot of value since then. Um, and you know, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. So I think that was the nicest thing that somebody's ever done. Um, well, money is great, but, but more than that, just mentorship and, and growth and scale yeah, together. He, he believed in you, right? When, before, when, when, you know, you were Patrick, I have, right? I had one, I had one. Yeah. So yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think that's, you know, there's a product of you, you and you trying hard. I think people really, as someone that's older, like you, you definitely, like I see people that have a lot of promise. Like you just see people that like have effort and like integrity. Right. And those are the people that you would align with. Even if it doesn't, even if it didn't work out, it actually like, it didn't really, it, it, like it matters, of course, like no one's to lose money, but if someone really tried and like you kind of, you both knew what was going, you going in on it and like, there's no guarantees in life. But if you do that and are successful or even not, you know, like if you both put in the relationship where you both like put in what you said you would do and no matter the outcome, like those are always like great, great relationships now. So sh- yeah. shout out to Josh. If he's listening to this, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, you, yeah. you picked a great partner and, uh, we all in STR nation, uh, benefit from that. So, Patrick, thanks for spending time with me today. I really appreciate you sharing the the server space story and you know how it, you, you've now gotten to 53. You're, you're Mongol in, uh, in Joshua oh. Tree now. I love it. I can't, can't, I can't wait till next, our next conversation. You'll tell me uh, you know the next units that you get. But I uh, appreciate you sharing your story today. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Patrick.